Hey Summit, I'm Jamie Beer, I'm your online campus pastor. Well this week, it's a very exciting week because we are starting Gear Groups. It's the first week of Gear Groups. If you haven't signed up, there is still time. And I encourage you to sign up. Because when we sign up for Gear Groups, when we get involved and we get committed, this is one of the best ways that we can grow in our relationship with God, that we can grow in our relationships with each other. And I'm telling you, every time I'm a part of one, I walk away more encouraged and I walk away with deeper friendships. So you can sign up today at mysummit.church or on the app. Now we're going to turn it over and we're going to see what's going on at Summit this week. Hi, Summit ladies. We have a great event coming up here soon on October 7th at the Bartlett's house. We're going to have fire pits, food, and a fun time to hang out. Uh, we will also be learning all about what's to come in this next season, and we can't wait to see you all there. I'm Dan Halk. I'm one of the pastors around here. And some of you, well, come on. Thank you. That was the very helpful. I am new here, and uh, some of you are going, where's Jamie? Where's Pastor Jamie? Uh, don't worry, she's still here, and she is incredible, but we're sharing the duties, and sharing is caring, right? Sharing is caring. So uh, we are so glad you're here this morning, and if it is your first time, thank you so much for being here with us, and you'll notice in your card, in your bulletin, there's something called the card, and we would love to get to know you better. If you would fill that out, and after the service at our connection, table outside. You can turn that in and we've got a lovely gift for you. Uh, we also have some gear groups going on right now. Gear groups are our small groups. Come, come on. How many of you are in a gear group signed up? Let me see. A lot of hands going up. So if you have not signed up yet for a gear group, it's a great way to connect with other people, to have fun together, to grow together. So uh, you can still do that. Meet me outside in the connection table after the service. I'll help you get connected to a gear group. Uh, this is also the Sunday we do sync up. You guys know what sync up is? Come on. We get to know each other by connecting with each other. So find someone in the service maybe you've been wanting to get together with and get to know a little better and go out to lunch with them after the service and, and enjoy a nice meal and some fellowship. Come on. And last but not least, we have these beautiful, stylish Sundays are back. You guys enjoying the message series? Sundays are back? Come on. So we've got these wonderful t-shirts available. And you know what? I'm a little bit of a t-shirt snob. Some t-shirts are just not great. These are high quality, very nice, great conversation starters, as well as looking stylish. And these are for sale outside of the connection at the uh, bookstore there. So uh, we would love for you to come and get one. But I have two t-shirts for two lucky people this morning. Who wants a t-shirt? Who wants a t-shirt? Come on, there we go. There's one, see if we can get it. Ah! Oh. Okay, that was a really bad throw. Um, but uh, yeah, there's more of those outside, so we would love for us all to be outfitted properly. And this is the time of the service where we receive our morning tithes and offerings, so if I ha could have our ushers come forward. And you know, it was Jesus said, that said this. He said, it is better to give than to receive. You ever wondered why these billionaire philanthropists at the end of their life, all of a sudden they decided, oh, I want to give money away because there's something inside of us that feels good about it because God's wired us to give. And when we give, we know that God blesses us in return, but all kinds of ministry happens throughout the community. And so we're very grateful for you who give uh, faithfully every week. And I would just challenge you, if you haven't done it yet, just to make a commitment to give something to God every week and see what happens in your own life as well as the impact that our church can make. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to give back to you just a portion of what you have given to us. And Lord, we know that every good thing comes from your hand and we can trust you. And as, as we give joyfully, Lord, we just pray you would take these gifts and press them down to overflowing so that more ministry could be done through Summit Church. So more lives would be touched with the gospel of Christ and this community might know how much God loves them. So we just ask you to bless this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So in a recent survey uh, that showed American adults spend on average three hours, actually over three hours a day on social media, but only spend about 37 minutes of quality time with their family. Three hours on social media, 37 minutes of quality time with their family. And of 2,000 parents of school-aged children that were surveyed, over 60% described their average daily life as being hectic. And when asked what added to the, what contributed to the chaos, here were their answers. Long work hours, chores, and the kids having complex school and activity schedules. When asked about their marriages, 54% said they get at the very most just 12 date nights together in an entire year. 31% said they go often more than a month without getting a night together. 65% of them said that during date nights, they're also running errands and doing chores while out on their date. So maybe not even a date at all. Now, when we hear those statistics and we hear surveys like that, we do one of two things. We get kind of defensive and we go, well, that's not us. That's not our family. I don't spend three hours on social media in only 37 minutes. We sort of go into a denial mode before we've even begun to evaluate whether it's true about us whether or not we need to reevaluate evaluate how we prioritize our week. Or we do the other, and we say, oh, as much as I hate to admit it, some of those things sound to be somewhat true about us, if not entirely true about us. And maybe you don't have school-aged children. Maybe you have teenage kids or young adult kids, or maybe you're empty nesters, or maybe you're even single and are widowed and divorced, and you don't connect entirely with all of that, but maybe you'd be willing to admit that when it comes to prioritizing what you do with your week, you would admit that maybe not all your time is spent on things that grow you and contribute to your health and invest in relationships that matter and that are important. The thing is, you and I don't have to trouble ourselves with our subjective opinions about how our time should be spent, not at least as followers of Christ. There is a objective standard that's been set by God because God is, in his perfection, also the God of time and the God of time management and the God of schedules. We like to make God impractical sometimes. We like to make him all spiritual and God just sort of floats around and he's this benevolent vapor in the sky. And he doesn't relate to how we do life, but remember that the Bible gives us either a literal or allegorical timeline of God's creation, his work week, and then a definitive creation of the seventh day what we now celebrate as Sunday. And he says that there are things to be done in these six days and nothing of those six, th- uh, six days things should be done on the seventh because the seventh is set apart. Now, last week we talked about it being set apart for the time we would spend with just connecting with God and resting in God and and growing in him. And I know that it feels like um, we've sort of sold Sundays, the Sabbath, as this thing where you're not allowed to do anything, but you have to pray and sing and and you can read your Bible and uh, that's it though. You just, you have to go to church And so who would really look forward to a Sunday? And that's maybe why we conceded to the world. Yeah, you've got a better idea with Sundays. You get to go have fun. You have soccer practice. And and I can actually get some more money in the household by working on Sundays. and, and, And we can plan a lot of things on Sundays that we can't plan any other time during the week. And we sort of relinquished and surrendered and deferred our Sundays away. And then we wonder why we feel obligated to come and do this, why we feel like it's against the grain of what we'd rather be doing. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we have never been good managers of our time. We've always allowed our schedules to dictate to us instead of the other way around. 
Well, I can't because, and I can't, I wish I could, but I have this going on, as if we are involuntary participants in this big thing that just overpowers us, and we have no ability to say no or set priorities for our schedule, and God says, I've got a plan for you. And that plan is actually beneficial to you, and it's healthy for you, and you're really going to love it if you actually lean into it. And when it comes to the time we spend, not just with God, but with our family, God has a plan. It's lined out in Exodus 20, 8 through 11. It says, you and your family, you are to remember the Sabbath day and set it apart. Keep it holy, which means sacred and set apart for sacred purpose. You have six days to do all your work to get everything else done. But on the seventh day, it's to be different. It's not to look like, act like, behave like, or resemble in any way those other six days. It is the Sabbath of the eternal your God. It belongs to him. So keep it holy. Here's how we set it apart for sacred purposes. By not doing any work, not you, not your sons, not your daughters, not your male and female servants, not your livestock or any outsiders living among you. This was a way, by the way, in which God goes, stop looking for loopholes to get around what the Sabbath is for. Stop trying to find them what, well, males can't do it, but I bet our female servants can. And if they can't, then maybe we can automate our oxen and they can go plow the fields, even when we're just sort of yelling from the sidelines. For the eternal God made the heavens above, the earth below, the seas and the creatures in them in six days. Then on the seventh day, he rested. That is why, that's why he blessed the Sabbath and uh, the Sabbath day and made it sacred. God had a purpose and a reason for creating a day in which nothing gets done, at least nothing that resembles the other six days. You see, you have to remember this was written at a time where if they didn't work, there was no provision for them. They didn't have words like passive income. So as I scroll through TikTok, there's a lot of people who are like, did you know people will pay you four to five thousand dollars a month to do absolutely nothing at home? And I'm like, oh wow, I can't wait to hear <laughs> how this is even possible. And of course, there's no such job that pays for that. But the idea is we all want to get something for doing nothing. And this was a time in which their wealth was determined, their provision was determined by how hard they worked. And it was unfathomable to them that they would not work because if they didn't work, they didn't eat. And God said, I have a way of doing this in which your needs are met, you're prospering and blessed even when you're not going and doing. Because I will tell you this. I've done a lot of funerals. I, and I'm going to tell you, I hate doing funerals. I love doing weddings. I hate doing funerals. As you could imagine, it's horrible. It's hard. It's difficult to watch people grieve the person that they won't get to see anymore, the person that was valued to them, the person they loved, the person who they wish they had more time with. It's unbelievably painful to watch that because I identify with that. I empathize and I don't want to be on the receiving end of that. I don't want to watch someone I love like I have, unfortunately, in my own life, seen people I love and I will tell you this, I've never done a funeral in which any family member said, I wish they had just taken more of their time and worked harder to make more money so that we would have a bigger inheritance. What they want is another minute, another hour, another hug, another afternoon spent fishing together or laughing as they told their corny jokes. They just want more time. And yet you and I, we even today believe that we have the promise of tomorrow's tomorrow and after. And I want to tell you that God has a plan to set apart time that realigns our scheduling and our rhythms with his. Grab your notes if you don't already have them out. Open your Summit app. God set apart, he created for a sacred purpose Sunday so that we would, number one, focus on the work of building a stronger marriage 
and a bigger family. Now, before you think I'm advocating for um, not taking birth control and we're going to go the Catholic and Mormon route and we're going to populate the earth by, by ourselves, I have a different uh, perspective in mind. So just hang in there with me. So last week we talked about, um, you know, what we create in a week and that I believe that we are created in the image of God and in the nature of God. And the Bible says we're created God-like. And in being so, I believe that God has enabled us to be creative. And I don't mean just creative in, in the artistic sense of the word, but I mean creative in that we are capable of creating our world. I mean that you can, with your words, create, or with your words, create the world in which you live. The Bible says that in your words, you have the power of life and death. It says that if you open your mouth all the time, that you're going to get yourself in trouble. And so sometimes the trouble we find ourselves in is because we've created that trouble with what we said, because it started with what we thought, and then we went ahead and let it roll out of our mouth. Or that you can be poor because you're lazy, or that you can have provision in your life because you work. And so as we look at our week, we are the creators of the world that we lived in. If you live in a hostile, political, animus, battling, vitriolic, um, anger-filled world, you're just, you're raging over all that's going on in the world, can I tell you that you are the creator of that? You allow and choose what information makes it to you and how you absorb that and how you implement that and acclimate that into your life. You choose that. You know how I avoid getting really caught up in all the nonsense going on in the news? I don't watch it. That's how I shape my, and do you know what? I'm no less informed than you are. I mean, I know what's happening in the world. I just don't need Fox or CNN or MSNBC or Breitbart or whatever. I don't need them to shape my opinion about any of it. Because my worldview comes from being a hope-filled follower of Christ, not a paranoid whiner that comes from watching the news all the time, right? So that was a side thing. I'm not even charging you extra for that one. So listen, the, um, uh, the world we create is made up of, if you were to tell me how you create your world, I can, I can assuredly sort of tell you before you even open your mouth that it's made up of your work schedule. It's made up of the projects and the tasks that you have to accomplish that week. It's made up from chores that you do or kids' soccer practices or schedules of activities and meetings that you attend. And they all feel, they all feel very important. But I want to ask you this. How many of you have scheduled and put a measurable metric on the work the tangible, practical work you do to enrich and strengthen and grow your marriage. How many have made that as big of a priority that gets the attention in your schedule, in your priority list, in your doables that week? How many of you have scheduled growth in your marriage? I'm going to guess, like me, you haven't. But can I tell you this, in the scale of values and importance and priorities, is there, is your work more important than your marriage? Your kids aren't even more important than your marriage. Because your kids' lives will be shaped by how you live out your life in front of them. And the value you place on your marriage will be the value ultimately they place on theirs. And how they see you treat your spouse and the priority that your spouse gets in your life and the effort you put into that relationship, that's what your kids are being shaped and taught by. And so you and I have to take responsibility for the fact that it's very possible that the relationship that we currently have with our spouse is not because other things are dictating to us whether or not we get to spend more time with them, but we're simply surrendering our calendar. We're surrendering our priorities and letting everything else rise to the place of importance that we neglect our relationship. So, I want to read a passage to you, and um, 
it's kind of a, it's kind of a magical passage. So I want you to act, if you've heard it, I want you to act like maybe you haven't. Okay. So sort of flush your, your biblical brain for a second. Bible says this uh, in Ephesians 5. It says, in fir- this is the 21st chapter, and then I skip down um, to the 31st and 32nd. And further, this is talking to husbands and wives. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now I'm going to pause right there. Because that line is reflective of all these other verses that were right before it. Or actually that follow it as well. And it's a bunch of practical explanation of how we have to do that in each other. And if you read it, it is um, describing what is, feels like almost impossible work to do in our relationships. Because it calls on us to go far outside of our nature in order to make our marriage work. It asks for husbands who are respect-driven to love their wives. That's not men's love language. That's not our, that's not how we connect. If somebody, um, uh, so yesterday I was um, doing a U-turn. I was going to get um, mod pizza over on Blue Oaks and I passed it up. I was not paying attention where I was going and I go up to an intersection. I'm like, I'm gonna do a U-turn here. Well, when I have the green, right, the green arrow, I had the right of way to do the U-turn and a truck turning he was turning right onto the same street I was going to do U-turn on. He just went as we, and I almost hit him, and I laid on my horn like you jetted out, bro. That was the wrong time to do that. He purposely slowed down, and we pulled up alongside each other, and he, um, his horn must have been broken because he used his finger instead to <laughs> alert me. He was aware of um, my presence there. Now, what was funny uh, was we had our windows down and I go, bro, I had the right of way. Like, what are you mad at me for? And he said something um, about his anatomy and something I should do to it. And I was like, okay, well, this isn't going well. I'm going to go grab a pizza. And um, that is the perfect example of the language men speak, which is he felt disrespected because I honked my horn at him, and then he was going to disrespect me in a greater way. So ladies, if your husband shut down or whatever, it's typically because at some point they feel disrespected or felt disrespected, right? And ladies, the Bible calls on you to respect your husbands, which is not the language of women. You're, you dwell well inside the space of love. And so when you shut down, it tends to be because you don't feel loved, right? And so God calls on us both to do the work of marriage, and that is to become loving and respectful to each other. And that is the work of submitting to each other, right? Then it goes on to say, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother, and he is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And then it goes on to say this. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Can I tell you the magic of what that just said? That you can know the health of your marriage by the health of your relationship with Christ. And you can know the health of your relationship with Christ because of the health of your marriage. And you cannot invest in your relationship with Christ without investing in your relationship with your spouse. Because the Bible tells us that God purposely, intentionally uses the illustration, the symbol of marriage and the intimacy shared between husband and wife. He uses that as the health indicator that we use to determine the health in our relationship with him. That is really, really encouraging and really, really scary. Because it exposes our selfishness, it exposes the lack of work that we put into it. Because here's the deal, if you can't make it work with someone who's there with you, who, somebody who's committed themselves to you, somebody who is um, um, under your care, 
And both of us are under each other's cares because we're submitted to each other. We've submitted the vulnerability of our hearts and our minds and our bodies to each other. And the body talks about the two flesh becoming one. That's talking about the sexual union that takes place between a husband and wife. That also, if you know this from being married that in, in, or just being sexually experienced at all, you know that there is an emotional and mental and even spiritual connection that happens during that intimacy. And the Bible says that is the intimacy, that is the closeness that God is saying symbolizes our relationship with him. So that would tell me that you and I, in setting aside our Sabbath, our Sundays, that you and I are not just in here doing this for the sake of our spiritual growth, our own worship experience, but we're doing this as an investment in the health of our relationship with the person that we've committed our lives to. And then when we go home and we commit to spending time together as husband and wife and reevaluating our priorities and what we created in our week, then we're also growing our relationship with Christ because there is no more important relationship in your life than the one that you have with your spouse. And you say, what about my relationship with Jesus? According to scripture, you can determine And you can gauge the health of your relationship with Christ by the health of your relationship with your spouse. If you are having a very hard time forgiving your spouse, that means there is a spiritual work that has to take place. And you have not connected to the grace of Christ. Can I say that again for those in back? Check, check, check. That if you can't forgive your spouse, the Bible is clear that when we can't release each other in forgiveness, Christ won't release us in forgiveness. So we are growing in our relationship with him when we're growing in our relationship with each other. Now, I'm going to tell you this, that there is more to this. And I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to move quickly through the other two points. You can take a big deep breath, all right? So uh, unclench, all right? Um, uh, 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 That those of you who are single, widowed, divorced, and you go, oh, I love messages that are about married people. I can just sort of get on my phone and go through TikTok and stuff. So I want you to know this, that there is... Um, the, the wonders of the way God created relationship is there is a dynamic for both married and unmarried in which God calls us to expand relationships beyond titled relationships in our life. Let me read a passage to you out of Matthew 12, 46 through 50. It says, while he was still talking to the crowd, this is Jesus, His mother and brother showed up. They were outside trying to get a message to him. Now, I want you to visually picture this. Possibly it was inside, but often when they say outside, they mean outside sort of the ring of people. So this is probably a large gathering of people. It wasn't in a small room where they could have just stood and waved at Jesus and gotten his attention. This is probably a large gathering. And they were probably outside that circle, not close enough to Jesus, and they wanted to get a word to him. So they're outside trying to get a message to him. And someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are out here wanting to speak with you. Jesus didn't respond directly like, okay, tell him I'll be out in just a minute. He stopped and he turned to the crowd and he said, who do you think my mother and brothers are? And then he stretched out his hands towards his disciples and he said, look closely. These are my mother and brothers. Now that may feel a little bit harsh, but it's not. It's not meant to be a slight on his mother and brothers. It's meant to be a compliment to his disciples, to those closest to him to those that he was influencing and those that he was relying on in friendship and those that he was doing ministry with and those that he was growing faith in. Jesus was paying them the compliment of saying that these relationships transcend titles. How important is a mother to a son? Especially in Jewish culture, there's a close, tight bond of relationship between mother and son and brothers. They're related by blood. And Jesus actually says, blood is thicker than water. And we go, well, that's, of course, true. That saying means this, that the blood oath that we take when we cut hands and we join together in blood, he says that is actually stronger than the water birth, the birth of the, 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 when a woman's water breaks, and that is the symbol of a birth relationship. He says, the covenant you choose between relationships is even greater than the ones that you are connected to by blood. And so what does that mean? 
means that you and I aren't just sitting among people. We are sitting among those who have the potential to be brother and mother, an intimate friend with us. And so when you set aside a time in which you are investing in that culture and that principle, you're investing in relationships that shape you and move you and motivate you. Second is this. God set apart Sunday so that we would create an honor culture for our kids. So really quick, um, I spent 15 years in full-time youth ministry. And in doing so, I ran into a lot of parents who had a role for me to play. And here was the role. They would take care of feeding them, clothing them, housing them, teaching them about marriage, teaching them about finances, teaching them about attitude, teaching them about character and morals, and everything else that mattered in life. And I could teach them about God. That's what I got to do. That was the role they wanted me to play. <clears throat> Now, here's the weird thing about that. When anything went wrong in school, attitude, morals, relationships, anything, it was that I wasn't doing my job well enough in teaching them about God and teaching them about the Bible. And this was a great opportunity for me to share a little truth with them that they weren't always fond of, was that I was not the primary pastor in their kid's life. That they were the constant representation of the heart of God or the heart of man or the heart of the world. That no one was going to teach their kids more about marriage and more about God and the character of God and what God wants from us and God's highest and best in our marriage, in our money, in our morality, in how we do our lives. No one was going to teach them more than they as the parent were. So they are the frontline preacher that with their own lives demonstrates the authenticity or the hypocrisy of what it means to be a Christ follower. It wasn't my 90 minutes with them on a Tuesday night that was undoing all of their hard work during the week. It was often me in 90 minutes trying to grab their attention long enough to teach them something possibly they weren't seeing modeled at home. And I have to tell you that if you want your kids to be Christ followers, if you want them to experience God's highest and best, teaching them how you do things may feel like the right move, but teaching them how God wants them in relationship with him so that God has a voice in their life to lead them to their own destiny. Listen, I want to shape my kids' lives. I want to direct their behavior. I want to tell them where to go and what to do because I think sometimes that I know best for them or at the very least, I know more than they do. But as a follower of Christ, I have to remember that I don't know nearly as much as God does and I didn't create them for his purposes. He did. And modeling what it looks like to just be a flawed Christ follower is far more effective in shaping their lives. I love what it says in 2 Timothy 1.5. And this is Paul writing to Timothy, who was a young man. And he said, what strikes me most is how natural and sincere your faith is. I'm convinced that the same faith that dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, abides in you well. He said, it's because of how you were raised that you have this natural, organic faith. It just comes from you naturally because you saw it modeled. Then just a few chapters later in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, he says this. So surely you ought to stick to what you know is certain. If your faith is being questioned and people are getting into your head and they're trying to make you doubt your faith, all you have learned comes from people you know and trust because since childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures, which enable you to be wise and lead to salvation through faith in Jesus the Anointed. He says, listen, even if you don't trust everything, at least trust the people who taught you what you know. Trust their motives. Trust why they taught you what they taught you. And then Deuteronomy says this, 6, 6 through 8. You say, well, we try to do our best to get him into church. We try to make it a priority. But listen to the priority that God places on living out his mandates in life. He says, make the things that I'm commanding you today part of who you are. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you're sitting together in your home and when you're walking together down the road or driving in the car. Make them the last thing you talk about before you go to bed and the first thing you talk about the next morning. 
Do whatever it takes to remember them. Tie a reminder on your hand and bind a reminder on your forehead where you'll see it at all times. God says, it's not a moment on a Sunday morning in which you prioritize God in your home for your children to honor him and honor the way he does marriage and honor the way he does communication and honor the way he does relationship and honor the way he does grace with people. Teach a culture of honor 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then third and finally is this, God set apart Sundays so that we would qualify ourselves for the blessings that protect what we value. We'd qualify ourselves for the blessings that protect what we value. As you know, I have three boys, three sons. They're all adults. Uh, Caleb's 28, 28. Cole just turned 23. Four, 23, and Carson's 19. I got that one right because he still lives with me. So I, I, I know that one. And uh, they can't do anything to be more my sons than they already are or can't do anything to be any less my sons. So they are, by relationship, my sons and I'm their father. Now, the relationship to my favor and my blessing that they do have control over. So I logically couldn't have one son who is rebellious and dishonoring and, and, um, and rebels against uh, me and my rules for my home and uh, what I believe in. I can't have them do that and then receive the same favor and blessing as the one who honors me and honors the rules and honors me as their father. They're both my sons, and my love is not diminished for either one of them. But how I reward them, that is different. Because reward is a result of a behavior that you want to reinforce. And consequence comes uh, from a behavior that you don't want to reinforce. And so is our relationship with God. As a Christ follower, you are a child of God. And nothing you do makes you more of a child of God or nothing that you do makes you less of a child of God. I can't wait till October. We're doing a whole series on sin and grace. But I want to tell you, positionally, you are in right relationship with God even when you're at your very worst because that is what grace does for you. But I will tell you that blessing is conditional because the Bible's full of one illustration after the other where God says, if you'll do this, then I'll do this for you. Listen to what it says in Malachi 3, 8 through 11. This is a perfect example. Do honest people rob God? He's talking to the Israelites, but you rob me day after day. And you ask, well, how have we robbed you? The tithe and the offering, that's how. And now you're under a curse. The whole lot of you, the whole nation is under a curse because you're robbing me. He says, bring your full tithe to the temple treasury so that there'll be ample provisions in my temple. Test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessings beyond your wildest dreams. From my part, I will defend you against marauders, protect your wheat fields and vegetables and gardens against plunderers. God says, if you'll do this, then here's what you'll get and return for that. Your obedience brings favor and blessing in which I pour out blessings you can't even contain and I will guard you and protect you against things that will destroy your wealth. That's conditional blessing. They were no less the chosen of God. The Israelites are the chosen people of God. They were no less God's chosen people. Nothing they ever did removed them from the position of being God's chosen people. But from blessing, yes. And this is what it looks like for us. Exodus 16, 22 and 24, or 3, 24 says this, and this is where we're ending. On the sixth day, the people gathered twice as much. This is when they were on the run from captivity in 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and they're now out on their own, and they're learning how to be self-sufficient, and they're learning how to trust God, and they don't have a source of food, and so God is literally making it rain like bread. So they would wake up, and there'd be a layer of bread on the ground 
called manna, and they, it was a sweet bread, and they would gather that up. And he said, on the seventh day, gather no bread. And he also said, every single day, only gather what you need. Don't gather more than you need, because there'll be provision for you the next day. Except on the Sabbath, there won't be. So then he tells them, uh, to gather twice as much. Uh, the people gathered twice as much. It amounted to six pounds for each person. The leaders of the community came and reported that to Moses. And he said to them, here is what the Lord commanded. He said, tomorrow will be a day of rest. It will be a holy Sabbath day. It will be set apart for the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, boil what you want to boil, and then save what's left. Keep it until morning. And so they saved it until morning, just as Moses commanded, and it didn't stink or get maggots in it. <laughs> and that's a fun verse to end on. Because this was a very practical way in which God shows that his provision is number one from him. And he says, I know that you think you can do more and that if you just... For your family's sake, you'll go out and work another day. You'll go do more for your family's sake. You've got to get this done. And the kids need to be well-rounded, so they need to know how to play on a team. And that's why we have them in soccer. And that's why we miss on Sundays. And I want to tell you this, that God has a system in which your kids are going to be okay if you trust him. They're going to be well-adjusted. You want to teach them how to play on a team? Teach them how to serve in children's ministry or serve in the youth ministry or... Stand at the door with you and greet people. Teach them what it looks like to serve the body of Christ or to serve with you on a Sunday afternoon. You say, we're going to go do something to serve someone in our community who's in need. This afternoon, one of our staff is going to meet up with somebody who's living here in town because they've been displaced by the fires. And they reached out to us and just said, we don't want money, just if you could get us blankets and, and some kitchen stuff. We're staying in an in a RV on somebody's property. And we fled when it was 115 degrees. We don't have anything warm to sleep in or warm blankets. And That's serving someone in a practical way. And you can do things like that. If you want your kids to be well adjusted, create a culture in which you honor God, honor your marriage, and honor the idea that God has provided a way for everything you think you need in your life. God's provision has already considered that. And everything that you don't actually need in your life, God's provision has considered that as well. You know what happens when we take things into our own hands? They stink and they get maggots in them. They rot because it's produced by our hands. And things that are produced by God that we just receive from him without doing anything for them. The, the resting in him, that's, it's not only fulfilling and it not only meets your needs, it leaves you satisfied. And God says in the six days, do whatever you want. Bake whatever you want. Boil whatever you want. Do the work that you want. But I'm telling you, there is a magic that happens in the rest of the Sabbath. And Sundays are only as magical as you make them. You have to take them back, though. Be honest enough to say that you've given them up to things, that you've surrendered them to things, that you're not prioritizing God or your marriage or building a bigger family or setting a culture in your home in which honors God in all things all the time. Just be honest enough to say that because when you say that, you can say, now I'm going to take it back. What I've given away, I'm going to take it back. And I promise you it can be restored to you and not just restored to you, but multiplied back to you because God will honor that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a second? There's nothing uber spiritual about that in and of itself. It just gives you a moment to be alone with this. With this moment, with what God's prompting in your heart. And I would ask this first, if you would just say, first of all, I'm not even a Christ follower. But if he would accept me, just as I am right here without changing a single thing. In our sinfulness, everything about us that's not like you 
it sort of warps our thinking. We don't get it right. We try to do it all the wrong ways. We go to the wrong things and we spend our time the wrong way and we're just determined to stop doing that. And we don't have to do more in order to fix it. We just have to stop doing. We have to lean in to what you made the Sabbath for, what you made Sunday for. We just can rest in you and not do and not let our week tell us what we're going to do with this day and not let our work tell us what we're going to do with this day and our needs tell us what we're going to do with this day and we're going to do what we're supposed to do with it and we're going to create a culture that honors you and we're going to protect it because in protecting it we protect the blessings that come from it and we protect ourselves from the rot and the decay and the marauders that come and steal provision that you meant for us and growth that you meant for us and health that you meant for us. So we surrender our Sundays to you. First to you and for you. And then to our relationships, our marriage and our family. And building a bigger family with people sitting right next to us and other believers and even those that we might lead to know Christ in their own life. We thank you for all that's to come of this because we know that planting seed, when it's watered, when it's fertilized, when it's cared for, it's going to produce in our lives. And so we commit ourselves to that, the work of growing this seed in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And happy birthday to Howard Steele. It's his birthday today. I love this whole message series on rest on the Sabbath. It's been amazing. If you've missed any of them, go back and listen to them this week. Listen to them in the car, on your way to the gym, at the gym, wherever you're at, and kind of figure out how to form your life around this concept of rest and giving this day to God and what that looks like for you and for your family. Well, again, sign up for your group groups. They are starting this week. You can sign up on the app or at mysummit.church, and I will see you next week. Bye.